much for the presence of the defendant and all counsel. This is the time set to hear objections on the juror questions. The defendant had approximately an hour and a half to review the questions. The state had an hour and 20 minutes to review the questions. Um, are you prepared to make your objections? Yes. Yes, Your Honor. All right, let's start. Um, I asked you yesterday if you would identify your objections by the question number. They start at 42. All right, let's hear objections. Uh, who wants to go first? I'll just list out my objections. And, okay. Um, I would object to questions 43, 60, Okay, 70. hold on. 43, uh -huh. 60, 75, and 90. See, 75 and 90. And do you want the reasons? or just uh, Maybe we can save some time with um, some of them. 43 and 60 we would agree with. Right, hold on one second. I'm still marking. You're okay. step ahead of me. All right, so 43. There's no objection. You're, you're both in agreement. We would object as well, so yes, we're both in agreement. All right. So we sustain the objection to juror question 43. It will not be asked. All right. Number 60, what's the defense position? We would also be objecting to that, so we would agree to the state's objection. All right. I'm going to sustain the objection to juror question number 60. Takes us to 75. There are three questions on 75. Well, these, the, that question I believe was prefaced with Detective Flores this night. We would object to Ms. Harris being asked that question. Yes. So, question 75 is not an appropriate question for the defendant. So, I will sustain the objection to question 75. Now, that takes us to 90. <laughs> And Objection. We would we we had the intent of objecting as well, so we would obviously do it. Right. Court will sustain the objection to your question. Any other objections from the state to any of the questions? I have no objection. Okay. Mr. Nermi. We'll attempt to go in numerical order as best I can. Uh, let's see, we dealt with forty-three. Uh, question 50, uh, as to the relevance. State's position. I believe that it is relevant. They're talking about financial issues and the defendant's uh, surgical procedure. All right, I'm going to sustain the objection to question 50 on relevant grounds. Right? Yes. Yeah. Um, the next in order being uh, the question 55. Drawing the court's attention to uh, part two, what well, we've interpreted as part two of that question. If there's clarification, we can certainly provide that if we have the question. But so your objection, <clears throat> there is no objection to the first question. There is an objection to the second and third questions. No, part two. <coughs> well, Maybe if we could approach to yes.
Question two, questions two and three on juror question 55 are overruled. Court will ask both questions. Mr. Nermi? Uh, question 61. Foundation of when the question isn't specific enough. Overruled. Um, I, I think that you can inquire about more foundation when you do follow up. Um, it's clear to me that the reference is the June 2008 trip. Why don't you approach since you don't have copies of the questions? Objection to question 61 is overruled. I will ask that question. Mr. Nermi. Uh, number uh, 89 included. State's position. Evidence regarding this issue that was presented, and so I will leave it to your discretion. I do believe that it is appropriate given the evidence that was introduced, um, but I also understand uh, the 401, 402, and 403 concerns. I'm going to sustain the objection to question 89 for all of those reasons. 
And forgive me, Judge, did we address number 62 yet? No. All right. Your objection? Uh, the answer necessarily delves into uh, privileged, attorney client privileged information. Please approach. Question uh, 69. There are four questions on number 69. Number two, forgive me, Your Honor, number two. I think you need to approach so that everyone can actually read the question. All right, it's actually the third question. To be technical, it's actually the fourth because in the second grouping there are two questions. So it would be the fourth question. I will preface it by adding to your knowledge, the objection is overruled. Um, number uh, 90. Judge, uh, you've already. 90 is, is out. Oh, I'm sorry. Right. Correct. Um, Number 97, two of 97. Why don't you approach,
Objection to question two on number 97 is overruled. The question will be asked. Number 74. 74. And the objectionable part is being part two of the question. Approach again, please. I don't know how many more. To your question.
One, the objection is overruled. The question will be asked. Ask both parts. Third and fourth questions.
Your question 110, the fourth question, objection overruled. However, it, it will be asked in a slightly different fashion than indicated on the juror question. Question 111, the first part, objection overruled, the question will be asked. Juror question 109, the second question, 
Objection sustained. Seven, question number one, the objection is overruled, the question will be asked. All right, counsel, are there any other objections to these questions? Yes, and I'm going to uh, meet with counsel on that objection. Oh, counsel, one additional.
The court will see defense counsel in chambers.
one thing I would ask you to, to leave again for just about a moment. If you'll go back into the hallway for just a moment, thank you. Ms. Arias, you need to take the stand, please. Amen. Please be seated. The record will show the presence of the jury, the defendant, and all counsel. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience. We had a mechanical difficulty. It is now corrected. This is the time set for the court to ask the questions you have submitted. Before I ask your questions, I would like to refer you back to your preliminary jury instructions, page 16.
I'm going to read portions of that preliminary jury instruction to you. If you have a question about the case for a witness, write it down, but do not sign it. The lawyers and I will discuss the question. The rules of evidence or other, or other rules of law may prevent some questions from being asked. If the rules permit the question and the answer is available, an answer will be given at the earliest opportunity. When we do not ask a question, it is no reflection on the person submitting it. You should attach no significance to the failure to ask a question. I will apply the same legal standards to your questions as I do to the questions asked by the lawyers. If a particular question is not asked, please do not guess why or what the answer might have been. Ms. Arias, you are still under oath. Do you understand? Yes. I'm going to ask the questions in the order they were submitted. Did Mr. Alexander pay for a majority of your trips? No, they were all split 50-50. If he did pay, was that a factor in you questioning his choices? For example, introdu introduction to others and sleeping arrangements. He created the itineraries, but I'm not really sure how to answer that. Um, he made all the itineraries for our trips, but we split the cost 50-50, if that makes sense. Was it his money, his choices? It was his choices on the church history trips because he knew which places would be significant in the church history. Um, I believe the choices were mutual as far as the list that we were trying to check off for a thousand places to see. And what was the last part of that question? Was it his money, his choices? Sometimes it was his money and I would make it up to him through housekeeping. Sometimes it was my money and he would pay me back. Why did you put the camera in the washer? I don't have memory of that. I don't know why I would do that. Did you ever take pictures of yourself after he hit you? No, I did not. Why did you call the cops on your ex who shook you, but you never called the cops on Travis? When, well, that was when he tried to break my forearm. We were wrestling. I was trying to get to the phone. It seemed logical to call 911. Um, I never did with Travis because that one prior experience with calling 911, he grabbed the phone out of my hand, hung it up. It was a very negative experience. He told me to shut up, they're gonna call back. They did call back, he created an excuse as to why 911 is accidentally dialed. And so after that, I mean, this was years and years later. Um, as far as June 4th, there were no phones upstairs, to my knowledge. And for previous reasons, he would make up for it in ways that Bobby didn't. Why would you continue to sleep with Travis after you learned of his child porn issues? That was not a side of Travis that, that he wanted to even exist. And of course I didn't want it to exist. He had told me that when he slept with women. Sustained. Answer the question without referring to a statement. Okay. Um, I was under the impression that when he was able to sleep with a woman, as opposed to fantasizing about a child, he felt like more normal as a, as a man. So, also I had seen prior to this incident many beautiful qualities about him and good qualities about him and things that were attractive about him. And I believe that this incident was a negative part of himself that he didn't want to foster or that he was fighting or struggling against and that he ultimately wanted to eradicate. Why didn't you just change your Gmail password so Travis could not get into it anymore? It didn't really become a problem right away when we exchanged our passwords. And so it just stayed that way for many months. And after I moved, it became a, it became a problem. So eventually I did change my passwords. However, on 
And I know this date because of our text messages and things. It was May 22nd, 2008. Um, we had a conversation, that in my journal entries, I remember. We had a conversation where we decided we're not going to do that anymore. So when, after that conversation, I made no further attempts to ever log into his accounts. And to my knowledge, I don't think he made any attempts to log into my accounts either. Did Travis's closet doors have locks on them? I don't remember them having any locks. If no, how did you have time to get the gun down if he was right behind you? I don't know if he was right behind me or not. I just had the sense that he was chasing after me. Did you record other phone sex conversations? Yes. Ryan Burns testified that he met you at a PPL event in April 2008 and you had blonde hair. How is that possible if you dyed it in March 2008? Well, the reason that is the case is because I didn't meet Ryan at convention in April 2008 because convention is not in April, it's in March. So he got the month wrong is all. Convention always occurs in September and six months later in March. Why did you feel so uncomfortable about anal sex with Travis when you had previously tried it? In my previous relationships, it was only something we tried one time, maybe two times, and those were long-term relationships. The reason that that was not a regular part of the bedroom curriculum was because it was uncomfortable. And with Travis, that was his preference and that's one of the reasons I got the KY, it made it less uncomfortable, obviously. So that's why it became more regular in our relationship. You took pictures of the shirt and shorts. Did you take pictures of the Spider-Man underwear? If no, why not? I did not take pictures of those because that's embarrassing, um, as opposed to the shorts and shirt, which were sentimental to me. I didn't want to memorialize boys underwear and I didn't want people to know that that was a preference of his and that I was dumb enough to go along with that preference. You told Daryl you wanted to abstain from sex until you were married. If that were the case, why did you have sexual relations with Travis? Well, my understanding at the time, Daryl and I did not we were not intimate after convention, and shortly thereafter, the missionaries began to come over to my house and preach about the law of chastity. They didn't overly preach, they mentioned it and ex explained it briefly. Um, not in great detail, I wasn't comfortable asking these two young kids that I just met um, in detail about it. But Travis and I had intimate conversations, and he, how he explained it to me was that vaginal sex is absolutely off limits, and everything else is not as egregious to that law. Travis stated on the phone sex conversation, he did not like Spider-Man. Why did he buy you Spider-Man underwear if he did not like that character? I don't know why, but they were Spider-Man. And I, I do know, however, that prior, the year prior, he, there's a child he was close with that really liked Spider-Man. I don't know if that had anything to do with it, but. He was very much into Spider-Man. He would dress up as Spider-Man. He had the... Um, she was asked if she knew why. Sustained. Why would you tell Leslie you wanted your kids to play with Travis's kids if you felt Travis was into younger children? This again is a statement that I made on June 5th. And I wanted to be able to, I wanted to edify Travis only in good ways at that point. I didn't want to say anything bad. Even prior to June 4th, I only would have edified him in a good way rather than saying anything negative about him. I wanted, I wanted him to be cast in a good light, not a negative light. If you had bruises that were visible after the April 2008 incident, why is it no one else said anything to you about those bruises? Well, that's... That's not really true. Um, the same day that the bruises occurred, there was a PPL associate who made a joke about it. Um, it was very embarrassing. 
he just, there were people around, we were at a business briefing, he joked about it. Um, Travis was in the joke and I got, I don't know if I got beat red, but it felt like I did. Um, I thought I, the makeup was covering them sufficiently. And then also Matt was somewhat confrontational about it. And at that point I was putting more makeup on. I had foundation cover up, something that was very opaque that I was putting on them from that point on. If you were so nearsighted, how were you able to drive? I never had a problem driving. Um, when I was on the freeway, I mean, I could see objects. They weren't very sharp, but they were sharp enough to where I could see whether or not I was in danger or driving safely or not. As far as freeway signs, I had to get closer to them to actually see what they said. But as far as I knew, that was normal vision. I'd never had glasses my entire life. And in 2010, I put on someone else's just for fun. And it was like, I didn't even know that you could see the world that way. Everything was sharp. So that's when I realized I need glasses. In Travis's text to Jody, text 12308, exhibit 444, he talks about the mysterious man you've never seen before that wrote for you. Who is this man and why is he bringing it up? That man would be Steve Carroll. He wrote me a very nice email and it went to my Gmail account, which Travis read. And when I tried to explain myself, I said, I've never even met him. And so he, I guess he thought he was a mysterious man, but I had never met Steve. That's what I told him. And it led to a big fight. Did Travis think it was someone you lied about? I think he did, the way he postured his words. You took a picture of the t-shirt and pink shorts, but not the boy's underwear. Why were the pictures taken so much later? They were taken in July. Um, I knew my time was winding down and by that point I had heard several rumors that said I was obsessed and all these things and I thought well if somebody finds these it does look a little strange to have a shirt that says Travis Alexander's and Travis is across the seat on the back of these shorts but so I didn't want those to be found I knew I was going to be arrested but they were sentimental to me so I still wanted to memorialize them in some way so I laid them out and I photographed them because they were special to me. You testified that Travis gave you the Book of Mormon at Starbucks. Did you read it thoroughly? If so, when? I did read the Book of Mormon thoroughly. Um, following that meeting, I attempted to read one chapter a day. And so I finished it sometime, I think I finished it in about eight months, more or less. And then thereafter in 2008, I read it, I started January 1st and read one chapter a day, not always consistently, but more or less, or I'd make up for it. And then I did that in 2009 and 10, and I haven't done it since. Does the Book of Mormon go into detail regarding the vow of chastity? It doesn't give explicit detail, but it does, and it doesn't even say law of chastity to my recollection. It just talks about, it uses verbiage such as whoredoms, things like that. Um, being unclean, and that's all in reference to sexual sin. So it doesn't go into detail, but it does reference that those things are considered sinful. Who initiated contact after the various breakups with Bobby, Matt, Daryl, and Travis? Start with Bobby. <coughs> um, let's see. With Bobby, we broke up and got together so many times, it would be hard to remember exactly what times when. Um, let's see, I know there was one time where I was packing all of my things and leaving. I was packing all my cars, driving away. Um, he lived in Montague. It's isolated. It's a tiny little town, about a thousand people. He had, his parents had already left to go into a rest home. He had nothing. He had no, no food, no money, nothing. So I sort of initiated contact in a way because after I took all my things to my grandmother's house, I went to the grocery store, I bought him a bunch of groceries and I brought them over to his house and I left them on the door and I left and he called me back for that. So in a way I initiated that contact by leaving the groceries on his porch and he knew it was me because he liked certain types of food and I got him those kinds. 
That's Yes. Uh, excuse me, Your Honor, the human device is coming in and out. I want to make sure I hear everything. Could we address that? Yes, we will address that. It could be part of the issue we were having earlier. We're going to give you another headset. We'll see if that helps. Sirius, I'm going to ask you to move the microphone back just slightly, back, Sorry. further back. That might help the issue as well. Sir, can you hear me now? Don't be sure it doesn't make any difference. It doesn't make any difference. All right, we are going to contact someone. So what we'll do is we'll take a recess and attempt to address that issue and then we'll, we'll be back with you shortly. So I'm going to ask the jury to go back to the jury room at this time. Please be seated. The record will show the presence of the jury, the defendant, and all counsel. <clears throat> Juror 13, thank you for letting us know you could not hear. Are you able to hear me now? Yes, Your Honor. All right. I want to make sure that you heard all of the testimony earlier from earlier, Juror 13. Did you let us know immediately when your earphones cut out? Yes, Your Honor. All right. So we will proceed then. I'm going to ask the last question again, and I'm going to ask Ms. Arias to answer it from the beginning. Who initiated contact after the various breakups with Bobby, Matt, Daryl, and Travis? Begin with Bobby. With Bobby, um, we had many breakups, and we got back together many times during our two-year period. and. Um, I'm trying to remember, I don't remember the specifics of each time, but it would have been both. I know one particular time when I was moving my things out of the house, I packed everything up and left and put it in my grandma's. This wasn't the time that I found out he was cheating on me. This was another time subsequent to that. And um, I guess I kind of initiated contact that time because I knew he didn't have a vehicle, money, job, and his parents were already in the rest home by then. So I went to the grocery store, I bought him some groceries, I left them on his porch. Um, so that he could have something to eat. And he called my grandmother's house after that and thanked me. So we picked up again, sort of. Um, we never really stopped contacting each other until we finally stopped for good. And I remember actually when we finally stopped for good, he sent me an email and I did call him back. And that conversation wasn't unfriendly, but it was definitely not a get back together conversation. And that's the last time he and I ever spoke. Um, let's see with Matt. I, we broke up after I can, well, I sort of confronted him. I went to his dad's house and he was there. He was on the phone with Bianca. So he already knew what I was there to talk about with him. We went into my car to chit chat and discuss this. There were a lot of tears. We knew we were done. We were broken up. Um, my heart was broken, and so what I did is I wrote out a long letter to him. Well, it was an email. I typed it out, and I sent it to him just so that he would know my, my heart, where my heart was, my thoughts, and that kind of thing, and where I felt that um, maybe he, well, he did err, where I felt he, he erred. And so um, that was just, it wasn't like trying to initiate contact again, but I did initiate, I did send him that. That was kind of just my goodbye email. Um, I don't remember how it came about that he ended up coming down to Ventana with me, but I know that he was looking for seasonal work and the time that he was in Borrego Springs, the 
this, the weekend or week that I found out about Bianca, that job um, application did not pan out. So he still needed a job and he came down to Ventana and Daryl hired him. Um, as far as Daryl, well, there was really no um, separation right away because when I broke up with him, we still had the same house together. We had separate bedrooms, but we would see each other coming and going. We had different work schedules mostly, but typically we both worked at night. So um, sometimes he was there in the daytime, whether I was at work or not. I had two jobs during most of that time. So we never really stopped contacting each other, but we stopped being intimate. Um, and then he moved away in early December. So I think we continued to contact each other for bills. Um, usually it was him because I didn't have money and I felt bad about that. So generally it was that, but I don't know. I've initiated contact since, like when I stopped by to visit his son and him um, later on in 2008. Um, as far as Travis, <coughs> we broke up over the phone on June 29th, 2007. And I don't remember, but I believe he called me the next morning. He was at his friend's, Chris and Sky's house, and he called me the next day. And we just had another conversation. Um, it was kind of more less dramatic. It was more just normal, the conversation. And then it ended up turning sexual. Um, so that proceeded that way. I continue to contact him as well. How far is Crater Lake from Ashland? Crater Lake from Ashland, I want to say 70 miles, I'm guessing. It's, I, I think I, there's a freeway sign somewhere in that area that says Crater Lake 70 miles. So, How it's far is that. Medford from Crater Lake? It's a similar distance. There are, if you imagine a triangle, you have Ashland, <laughs> just north you have Medford, and you can take a highway this way to Crater Lake or a highway this way to Crater Lake, and it's about a similar distance and driving time. How far is Medford from Ashland? Medford and Ashland, I'm not sure exact mileage, but it takes 10 to 15 minutes on the freeway. How did you know Victor's family? Victor, Victor Arias, my, my ex-boyfriend in Costa Rica, I moved to, Coast, well, I didn't move there, but I went there on an exchange program and lived there for a, a few weeks in the summer. Um, Victor was in that household at the time, and that's how we met, and that's how I knew his family. And when I went back there the second time, it was to spend time with his family. Victor had already moved out and moved on by that point. Please explain the events again that led up to your dad slapping you during the incident you described earlier. Um, I'm not clear if that's the one where he knocked me out or the actual slap, but I will describe the one where he slapped me twice. Um, that was, I snuck out of the house when I shouldn't have. Um, we were moving soon. I was the whole family was moving soon to Wairika. Um, I was very upset about it. Wairika is a small town. When you're going into high school, it just doesn't sound exciting to live there at all. Um, so I was upset, and we, my friends and I, friends that I had made, we wanted to spend more time together. So I snuck out of the house. We hung out. We um, I don't know what we did. We just hung out. And so sneaking out of the house was against the rules. And my parents found out. Um, I believe. They found out because the dog got in because I didn't shut the door all the way and woke them up. And so um, I don't think they waited up for me because they were asleep when I got back and I went to sleep and they woke me up around, I don't know what time it was. It was early, very early. And so he asked where I had been. I think I said, I don't know. And he smacked me. And then he sat me up, asked me again. And I think I said the same answer. He wasn't happy with whatever I'd said. And he smacked me again. What is your relationship with your mother like today? Um, it is very complicated and it's very strained. Um, her and I, we rub each other the wrong way all day long, but um, nonetheless, there is a deep love there. I don't think, I think there are very few individuals that I love as much as I love my mom. So in that regard, because it's strained, it's also very painful, but I love her a lot. What is your relationship with your father like today? Um, it's not incredibly close, but I have unconditional love for my dad, and I find that I'm able to love him better when we interact a little bit less, as opposed to more often, because I don't know if it's because our personalities don't jive, or 
I don't know. I, I think he's kind of a negative person, but maybe it's because I'm negative. I don't know. I'm not trying to blame him, but we get along and times we don't get along and at the times we don't get along, it, it hurts me. So I don't like to go there very often. Would it be possible to have Jody run through the attack on 6408 using the floor plan exhibit 249? Valerie, would you take exhibit 249 and put it on the projector, please? Sirius, will you run through the attack on June 4, 2008 using the floor plan? Can you move it up to show the shower and the bathroom? I don't know if it focuses out more to show more space. That's actually where you just had it was, well, yeah, maybe right about there. It might have to be moved again because the bathroom is long. Yeah, that's good. It'll probably have to be moved up, though. Eventually. I have, it okay. starts there. Let me know. Okay. Um, it started where Travis was in the shower. I was right outside the shower a few feet. I was taking photos of him, facing him in the shower. Back and forth, we would check the photos. Some got deleted because they didn't turn out great, or he was making a wrong expression or something. And then others we kept. And so I would do this and do that. And then we crouched and did the same thing. We tried a few different positions. And then um, at one point, I was we were deleting. And I went to move again and shift and face him. And the camera, it slipped. It was kind of like the best I could describe it like when you go to catch a football, but it bounces and you kind of fumble it a little because it, it didn't slip and just drop, it slipped and I tried to catch it and it kind of bounced a little and then fell on the ground and bounced and rolled onto the tile. It fell first on the mat, then it rolled right onto the tile. The mat isn't very big, it's just kind of right outside the shower and then the tile is right outside. So at that point, he got very angry and he stepped out of the shower. He lifted me up from the crouch position with enough force that my feet came off the ground momentarily and he body slammed me on the tile. At that point I rolled and I ran down the hallway, which is where seven is, goes on there. I'm sorry. Can you, yeah, right there. I'm gonna stop. Yes. I ran down the hallway. I ran into the closet. I slammed the door. I start running. If you are looking at the diagram, it would be on the left side of the seat. I began running that way with my initial intent to probably run out this door. I instead went for the gun. I grabbed the gun. Right, as, I don't, right about then, Travis was opening the door. I grabbed it. I ran out into the bathroom. He ran, I believe, straight toward the door as well. And can you show the bathroom area again? A little bit more. Yeah. At that point, I had run out of the bathroom, and I turned, and I just wanted him to stop, so I pointed the gun at him, hoping that that would just make him halt. And it didn't. Instead, he lunged at me right around the time that the gun went off, and I didn't mean for it to go off. We got... We fell with a pretty good force down in the corner, near 15, but not quite a, that close. It was kind of near the sink, kind of sort of that area. And he fell kind of on top of me, but to my right. I didn't want him to get on top of me. He was grabbing at my clothes. He was trying to get on top of me. I don't know where the gun went at that point. It was not in my hands anymore. If it got knocked out of my hands or if I dropped it, what? I broke away from him and as soon as I broke, the moment I broke away, that's when he threatened my life. I'd have no clear memories after that at all. It's things began to get really foggy after the gun went off and I don't, I know he was screaming and cursing. I don't know, remember exact words except the ones he said to me right after I dropped the camera, which was about a five-year-old being able to hold a camera better than me and that I was an idiot and he was using profanities with those statements. Regarding the 9mm 
9 millimeter gun you purchased on July 1st, 2008. You mentioned a camping trip as one of the reasons for the purchase. Who was going on the camping trip? There were, um, there was a two dishwashers from Purple Plum, which is where I had worked in the past and I was still friends with them. One guy's name was Calvin. I don't remember his last name. Um, he was somebody that I, I'm trying to remember if Calvin was one of the dishwashers or one of the customers or a former employee, but he was at the restaurant all the time. And then another guy, I don't remember his name, he's very tall, he worked at, as a dishwasher in the back and a prep cook, and he was going as well, as, and a few other people were all going, so that's all I can say with that. Why were you planning on going if you were scared? I wasn't scared, I was just being cautious. Um, these are people that I knew, but I wasn't very well acquainted with, and I just didn't want, to, I'd rather have it and not need it than need it suddenly and not have it being out in the wilderness. I didn't want, I wasn't scared, I was just being, I was trying to be cautious. I was, I mean, I had, I had seen like a new side of what a man can do, so I wanted to be extra careful as far as being out there alone with a group of men. I think maybe some women were coming too, but I didn't know at that point, I was the only girl on the trip. Were you paid for the interview with 48 hours? No, no, I never asked for compensation. They never offered, there was no compensation at all. Were you paid for the interview with Inside Edition? The same, no. Um, I was not paid. Someone encouraged me to ask because she had given an interview to Inside Edition and they paid her 50 bucks. Um, she had a charge in New York and they did that. And, um, but I did not ask and they didn't offer. In an interview with Detective Flores, Exhibit 503, you talked to him about taking photos of Travis while he was shaving. At some point, you state, he must have liked it because he used it on his MySpace page. Can you explain what he used? Yes, he used the photograph that was displayed yesterday. He used that photo as his profile picture. And what that means is if you type in the URL to his MySpace page, um, the profile comes up and you can, if it's public, you can see different things about the people or the person whose page it is. If it's private, you don't see those details, but you st still see the person's profile picture and that was his. So that was kind of his photo that represented his MySpace page. There were other photos within photo albums on the account, um, but the one that comes up on the front page or the main page of his thing was that photo of him shaving. So I assumed he liked it because that's what he was displaying to the world at that point. You stated that you tried to call Matt and Daryl about your change in plans regarding going to Mesa but said they did not answer. Why didn't you just leave them messages or text them? When I called Matt and Daryl, it wasn't really about the change in plans. It was more about, I was trying to see if I left my phone charger there because I couldn't find it anywhere and my battery juice was getting very low. So I definitely wouldn't have told Daryl I'm gonna go see Travis because I think that would have been a snub to him and I was still sensitive to his feelings in that area, nor would I have told Daryl I'm gonna go see this guy, Ryan. So I wouldn't have told him either of those. Um, I definitely wouldn't have told Matt that I was going to go see Travis because Matt um, had very, very negative opinions about Travis and he would have been very against it. You testified that you reported your cell phone lost in May of 2008. When and where was it found? Yes, I actually reported it to the Wairika Police Department as stolen, possibly lost. I thought it was stolen um, because I searched high and low and I left it in my grandfather's vehicle when I ran in to pay for Chinese takeout. And it's in Wairika. I mean, locking the car door isn't a big deal. Um, I, didn't, I, I didn't think I left it in there, but that was what I concluded when I made the report because it wasn't in my purse. I called it, it didn't ring. I looked everywhere. Um, was the rest of the question, when was it found? Yes. Okay. Um, it was found, to my understanding, in 2010. Um, my aunt found it, actually, she's sitting right over there on the front row. Um, she cleaned out my grandfather's car and found it somewhere in there and turned it over to my grandmother or my parents, I don't know. Sustained. 
Have you taken long trips by yourself, such as the one from California to Arizona to Utah in June of 2008 in the past? I'm sorry, will you repeat that? Have you taken long trips by yourself in the past, such as the one from California to Arizona to Utah, the one you took in June of 2008? Only along highways that I was familiar with, such as from Monterey County to Wairika, or after I became familiar with the drive from Arizona to Southern California. And the Monterey to Wairika drive, I'd probably driven it 50, not driven it, but ridden it with my family over the years, several, like countless times. I could name all the cities, all the landmarks, all those things along the way. I knew where everything was on those roads, and I had, had experiences in various cities along those roads. Um, so those roads I was familiar with, I've never driven on the I-15, at least for any great distance, and not outside of California. How often did you take such trips? Um, I like to do road trips. Travis and I began to do road trips. Sustained. How often did you take such trips? I wouldn't know an exact number. Hmm. During the trips you took, did you take extra gas cans with you? Um, only after I moved to the desert. Uh, Daryl was like, we're from the coast, so we had total shocks to our systems when we experienced our first summer here. And um, we began to carry cases of water in our trunk. And at, if we were going long distances, we'd carry a gas can just in case because he thought he would be like, you could die out here. You know, if, you, if something happens, if your car runs out of gas, you can't turn the air conditioning on, you could literally die of heat stroke, and that was a fear. So we carried water, and we didn't carry gas around with us all the time if we were just hanging around town, but if we went out to 29 Palms or somewhere like that, then that would, that would happen. If you took gas cans with you, where did you get them? I got two, the two gas, gas cans that I took on that trip, I got from Daryl. And then I bought the third one, and then I didn't. I determined I didn't need it, and I returned it. I think the question is referring to in the past, if you took gas cans with you, where did you get them? Oh, they were Daryl's. During your testimony, you mentioned Travis had hit your car once. Can you tell us about that incident? Yes. That was the incident in May 2007. We had spent two days at Disneyland and then drove, we were driving from Anaheim to Los Angeles where the Getty Center is because the Getty Center is on the list. That was our purpose for going. And on the way there, there was a ton of traffic. I don't remember if it was five lanes or six lanes, but it was bumper to bumper. Not any of the lanes were moving at all, hardly. We would just inch along, inch along, inch along. And he grew very frustrated, very impatient and angry. And he began just, I don't want to say what he said, but he just began yelling at other drivers and they weren't aware of him at all doing that, but he was just screaming at the other drivers. He was beating on the steering wheel. He would beat the inside of the door, the driver's side door, just with his fist or just this, the horns were on the sides. So he wasn't honking the horn, but he would beat the center of the steering wheel. Why did you confront Travis after seeing him with another woman through his backyard window if it was not due to jealousy? I felt that because he was making an effort, this was also right after he had, um, we had just slept together consensually by, and we went all the way and he said, I love you and all these things. So I felt like we were getting back together and when I saw that, it seemed in contrast to what he had been telling me for the last month, month and a half. So what I, my intention was to do was to go there and just find out what's the deal. She was asking, she wasn't jealous. Why did she confront him? I'm explaining why I went over there. You may continue. Okay. So my intention of going over there was not to, not out of jealousy, but it was because I wanted to know where I stood. Um, are, you, are we still trying this? Do you have a new girlfriend? If he had a girlfriend, that was fine. I just wanted to know. It was all. If you simply wanted to know where you stood because he was courting you back, why were you so upset that you needed to call your father about the incident the next day? I didn't want to call my father. I wanted to call my sister, my little sister, because her and I talk. We're relatively close, and we talk about stuff like that. It's a girl thing. So I called my parents home because she lived there at the time. And she wasn't home, but my dad answered. And he could tell that maybe I was sad. So that's why I began to talk to him. 
The reason I was sad was because we, Travis and I were getting back together. Sustained. Sustained. You mentioned an earlier failed attempt using rope during a sexual encounter. Can you tell us what happened that day, when this occurred, and how Travis handled the failure? I didn't hear that. Judge, can I ask a quick question? Certainly. I thought that last question said, why were you so upset that you had to call your father? So I began to explain why I was upset. All right. Your, your attorney will have an opportunity okay. to follow up with you later. Okay, thank you. You mentioned an earlier failed attempt using rope during a sexual encounter. Can you tell us what happened that day when this occurred and how Travis handled the failure? Yes. Um, he handled it just fine. He didn't get upset. We just stopped. He used twine and it was very scratchy and it sort of was not cutting into my wrist, but it was abrasive and it was somewhat painful. So at that point, he just cut the twine off with a knife as well. Did Travis's dog usually bark when someone came into the house? Yes, if the dog heard the door open, he was very animated and he would bark very loud. Did the dog usually bark with loud, unexplained noises? Typically only if the doorbell rang or somebody knocked at the front door. Why would you continue to stay with someone who had sex with you while you were sleeping? At that point, that would have been May 2007, I was in love with Travis. I knew I was in love with him and it didn't, it didn't make a difference to me, honestly. I was in love with him. My only concern was that I believed from a religious and spiritual perspective that our relationship would not be blessed if we acted that way. So, as in vaginal sex, that was my belief at the time. When did you find out that Travis had a gun? I found out in the fall 2007 when I was cleaning his shelves. I had different projects and it was around the fall. I don't remember if it was in October or November, um, but it was around that time. To your knowledge, did police ever find your grandfather's gun that was stolen? To my knowledge, no, none of the property that was stolen from that house was recovered ever. Why did you place Travis's body back in the shower? I could only speculate because I don't remember. And I could speculate based on who I know that I am or thought I was. Should I? Sustained, so don't answer the question. Do you know what time you left Travis's house on June 4, 2008? I don't remember the exact time, but as far as Objection. the daytime. Sustained. What happened to the clothes you were wearing on June 4, 2008? I don't remember. I was in clothes when I came to, and I don't. Sustained. You say Travis had attacked you before June 4, 2008, but would apologize to you after he did it. So why was the June 4, 2008 incident so different? June 4th was escalated and he always apologized afterward prior occasions. On prior occasions, I'd never feared for my life. And even when he was choking me out and I was losing consciousness, I didn't have enough time to fear for my life. I passed out. It wasn't until after that incident, when I reflected back on it, that I realized I could have died. And if he could take it that far, and he was as angry as he was, and I perceived very clearly that he was trying to get back on top of me again, that freaked me out. I was scared out of my mind. You and Travis continued to talk on the phone after you moved back to Irika, including phone sex. Would it be fair to say you were upset he was taking another woman to Cancun? Um, no, um, I was not upset. I wasn't upset at all, actually. Cancun was long, it was announced a year before. Um, he was taking a babysitter, I thought. I didn't learn that he was taking Mimi Hall until well afterward. Sustained. Why did you send his grandmother flowers? In retrospect, 
it probably wasn't a good idea, but I felt that it would be more insensitive to not do it, anything at all. Why did you take the rope and gun with you? There were a lot of actions I took that day that I don't remember. Um, but as far as disposing of it, I knew that something bad had happened and I knew that something, I felt like I had done something wrong. Did you lock Travis's bedroom door when you left on June 4, 2008? I don't remember anything of that nature, that whole time gap. I don't know. Did you try and clean up the scene after you left on June 4, 2008? Based on the evidence, I believe I did. Um, maybe make some kind of attempt, but I don't recall doing that. If you climbed on the shelf to grab the gun in a hurry, how is it that nothing was disorganized in Travis's closet? I only had to step on the edge with my foot. I put up one foot. I only had to just, well, it's the shelf, so I just had to grip the edge and grab it. So it's not quite as tall as it appeared in the photo. You just put one foot up on the edge, grab the other. You're up like two or three feet extra already. I grabbed the gun with my right hand, I believe. I don't know, right or left, probably right. And then I ran out the door. If you shot Travis first, how did the casing land on blood? I don't believe it landed on blood when the gunshot went off. Overruled. You may continue. Um, I do know that we struggled, so something could have happened subsequent to that. But to my knowledge, there was no blood in that bathroom before the gunshot went off. After you shot Travis, why not run out of the house to get away? Initially, that was my attempt. That's why I started running down the hall. The bedroom doors were closed. No, I said it got foggy after the shot. Overruled, you may continue. You may uh, continue. Maybe I misunderstood the question. I thought that it was after I got body slammed. Is that? After you shot Travis, why not run out of the house to get away? Okay, I'm sorry, that is correct. After I shot him, I didn't know that I shot him, but after the gun went off, he while he was lunging at me, we fell over and he was trying to get on top of me. It's hard to describe the fear. Um, it, was, it was like mortal terror, it really was. Um, when he was trying to get on top of me, I thought he was, and then he threatened my life, I really thought he was had intentions to kill me. So I don't remember sp any specifics of what happened right after that point. Why didn't you call 911? I was very scared of what would happen to me. Um, of what would, I was scared at that point of what was going to happen. I mean, I knew that, well, I felt that I had done something wrong and I don't have really an adequate explanation for my state of mind following that. I just know that I knew something really bad had happened and I was scared. If Travis attacked you on June 4th, why not just tell the police the truth from the start? That one's kind of a complicated answer. I didn't want, I didn't want people to know the kinds of things that were going on in our relationship. I felt that if I told police Travis attacked me, I would have to give explanation as to why he attacked me. And if I gave explanation as to why, I would have to go back through the different incidents that we've gone through and how those things didn't really begin until after I walked in on him. I believe they were related and I didn't ever want to go there. So it was all convoluted and I thought that by saying that, that that would open the door to that, to that, to that. And I didn't want to de-edify him. I didn't want, I was embarrassed about a lot of those things and I was ashamed. And I was also very scared about, I mean, whether I was defending myself or not, I felt like it's, I used to, I felt like it was wrong. Um, 
to heal somebody regardless of the circumstances. Were you kneeling when you dropped the camera? Yes, I was kneeling on one knee, I think. When Travis stepped out of the shower to attack you, was he wet? Yes. If so, did he slip at all on the tile in the bathroom or hallway? I didn't see him, but the tile is slick when it's wet. When entering the closet, why didn't you just go up in the door closest to you? My intention was not to run into the closet. When I rolled away, my intention was to run out of the room. Um, I didn't make the decision to go into the closet until I realized that by going left, well, it, I kind of just went back to that brief moment when he caught my wrist last time I intended to run left. And this time I would have to open the door. It would swing open this way. As I'm running down the hall, I would have to go this way. Like I would come down the hallway, the door would open this way, I would have to go out this way. So it just seemed this door over here was open. It split second decision. It just seemed safer to, or easier or faster to run in there and slam the door. And then I knew there was an exit. It wasn't a dead end. So there was another door there that I could run out of. Do you know how tall the ceiling in Travis's closet was? No. Was the gun in a case or just laying on the shelf? I don't remember how it was on June 4th when I first discovered it. I don't recall seeing a holster of any kind, but Travis did have one for it. I don't remember on June 4th. Why is it that you have no memory of stabbing Travis? I can't really explain why my mind did what it did. Maybe because it's too horrible. I don't know. I really don't know the answer as to why I blacked out or have memory gaps that m much of that day. Whether you had plans to commit suicide or not, why even mention no jury will ever convict me, mark my words, because I am innocent in the interview? Well, I was very confident that no jury would convict me because I was going to be dead. As far as saying I'm innocent, um, definitely innocent of my charge was what I meant. And also I assumed that I would be in the next life where I believe that, you know, God is the ultimate judge, that he would understand the circumstances of that day and that it would ultimately, that he would, that he would be, that he would know all of the circumstances that happened that day. So in that regard, innocent of the charge, but definitely there wouldn't be a conviction because you don't convict a dead person. I would be in the grave at that point. In your interviews you gave on TV, were you forced to answer all of the questions they asked you? I was not physically forced, but when you're put on the spot, it kind of feels like it, like, like you kind of, for some reason I felt like I had to answer every question, but I wasn't forced, if that makes sense. You have pictures of your other finger injuries that include timestamps. Do you have any pictures of your finger injury with timestamps? I guess that would be the left finger. Um, I didn't take a specific picture showing the injury, but any picture taken subsequent to June 22nd would show my ring finger bent, whether it was like that one in the photo or anywhere else. Do you have any pictures of you wearing a finger splint? No, definitely not. Did anyone see you wearing a finger splint? I wore it one day at when I was working at Mimi's Cafe, but I don't know if anyone commented it on it or not. So it was kind of embarrassing because it was a. She was saw it. Not whether anybody sustained. When did you realize that you had memory loss? The approximate date. Um, I, if that's a reference to June 4th, um, when I be pulled over in the car and I began searching around for the water, the shoes, everything, just trying to clean myself up and then that kind of thing, I, I can attribute it to being maybe 
I mean, I had memory loss one time when I was um, 19 because it was alcohol related and one time when I was 15 because it's alcohol related. So that's the only other thing I can attribute it to. Um, just like a blackout. So that was when I, shortly thereafter, when I couldn't remember things, certain things. Um, some things have come back to me since, but just not all of it. Did you have an attorney prior to the interview with CBS? Um, not for my case. I had an attorney for the limited purpose of assisting me in my extradition from yes. California. Is that a Sustained, yes or no? Um, yes, sort of, I guess. You said you got the two gas cans so that you could fill up in Nevada or Utah where gas was cheaper than California. Why did you fill the gas cans up in Pasadena? Yes, that's why I initially got the gas cans from Daryl, was so that I could save money on gas and that kind of thing. I'm a coupon clipper, that, that kind of person. But when I got to Southern California and realized I'm taking the I-15 across two and a half states, um, I've never driven this before, it's the middle of the night, I'm by myself. I didn't, I'm in a car that I don't really, I'm not very familiar with. I didn't want to be stuck in the dark somewhere in the desert. I've heard lots of horror stories and I wanted to make sure that I wasn't stranded. In all of the three hour church se sessions, family home evenings, missionary discussions, and other church events, you were never told or were never under the impression that other forms of sexual intercourse, oral and anal, were forbidden. I did get that impression on a few occasions, and I discussed it with Travis, and he clarified it for me in his way. She got it from these occasions, not when she spoke with the victim. Sustained. Is the answer yes? Um, somewhat, yes, but it wasn't clear. Did you know that Travis did not like John Dixon prior to your date with John Dixon? Prior to my first date with him, no, I didn't even know. I don't think he even knew John Dixon. Um, maybe I'd seen him through prepaid legal, but prior to that date, no. And I'm talking about before Travis and I became boyfriend-girlfriend. As far as the date that occurred after we broke up, I knew that he didn't care for John Dixon. Why were you willing to get involved with two men at the same time? Well, I was trying to get, it was very difficult to break away from Travis. Um, I knew we were going in separate directions, but we kept continuing with the same habits that we had. and. I had said before that I'm monogamous, and by that I, I do mean sexually monogamous for sure. I've never had more than one partner at the same time in that regard. Um, so as far as Ryan, um, he was just a potential person that I wanted to get to know. Um, and if things had gone further, then I definitely would have cut off that sort of contact with Travis. When you were asked about the video you made having sex with Travis on June 4, 2008, you said you used your camera, but when you were asked about your camera later, you said you didn't take it out of the car that day. Which of these two is true? For clarification, both is true. Both are true. The Canon stayed in the vehicle. My Olympus was tiny and it was always in my purse. So it went in and it, the Olympus um, is stylus 500 model, I think. And it had video and um, on it. The Canon did not. When you realized that you did not connect like you expected, why did you continue to speak to Travis? I think that's a reference to Ehrenberg because we weren't connecting the way we had before. Um, Travis and I connected very well over the phone, it seemed like. It was more of an emotional and mental sort of connection, a meeting of minds, so to speak. and. I was not going to contact him again after three failed attempts over the weekend, and then I didn't hear from him. So when he called me Tuesday and left me a very sweet voicemail, it kind of was a feeling of relief, like, oh, okay, I wasn't, I wasn't just being used. He still cares. So I called back and 
he was somewhat remorseful that we had gone that long without talking, and we agreed to not do that again. I mean, as far as going that long without communication. What is your understanding of the word skank? I don't know an official definition, but it's a very negative and pejorative, derogative turn uh, against women. Why did you share housing with Matt at the time you were in a relationship with Travis? Well, the reason I moved to Big Sur, well, I went to, I went, Matt was the available housing in Big Sur. And Matt, by this point, had reached. Available housing. Was it why? Overruled, you may continue. Okay. Uh, the reason I felt comfortable living with Matt was because at that point in time, this was, I want to say seven years after we'd broken up, our friendship had evolved to a point where we were like more like a brother-sister kind of relationship. There was no attraction, zero. We didn't even hug. It was just, we were just friends and we were more like siblings. And I think Travis understood that. I don't know. Sustained. Were there any girls working with you that you could share a room with? At Ventana, no, there were not. How can you be a sister to Matt, someone you had sex with in the past? It does sound strange, but it just has to do with the way our friendship evolved after the breakup. Um, I got over what he did with Bianca and that resentment melted away and gave way to sort of just a genuine goodwill toward him and him toward me. Also, um, our time at Ventana was broken up because when at one point, I think I'd mentioned on direct that the restaurant at Ventana closed. And so the entire dining operation was moved over to the inn and we operated out of there. During that five week period that the restaurant was being remodeled, Matt moved to Vail, Colorado. I didn't see him for six or seven or eight months. He had another relationship at that time. And by the time he moved back, Daryl and I had started a relationship. And at first it was a little bit awkward, but then Matt and I realized we're just, we just jive in a certain way, but it's more like we're better off friends rather than boyfriend, girlfriend. And that was a place where we reached an acceptance and there was no longer an attraction to Matt. I think it was more, I was blinded by love and now I saw all his other qualities. I still liked him as a person, but I wouldn't, I was not attracted to him, if that makes sense. <laughs> Why didn't you read the Book of Mormon to see what you were and were not allowed to do? I did read the Book of Mormon. Um, there is additional doctrine that explains the commandments a lot more called the Doctrine and Covenants. And the Book of Mormon does cover a lot of the basics. It's very similar. It's very similar to the Bible in some of the, the, those things, like the Beatitudes are sort of reworded in some, in one portion of it. Um, there, I think the Ten Commandments are sort of reworded in some portion of it, but it's more the Doctrine and Covenants that go into detail and also subsequent um, presidencies that have, the church has gone through have clarified even more um, what certain commandments mean, what that really entails, um, such as the word of wisdom. When the Doctrine and Covenants was written in the 1800s, it doesn't say anything about coffee, tea, alcohol, um, or illegal drugs. It mentions hot drinks and tobacco. And more clarification was given in the 20th century. And so it's kind of like that. Like I did read the Book of Mormon, but it's not ultra specific. Why did you ask Travis about everything you did? About everything I did? I don't understand that question. All right, then we'll move on to the next one. Why did you start a relationship with Ryan Burns when you said earlier, when I am with one guy, I don't see other guys? Well, I didn't consider myself Travis's girlfriend because I broke up with him on June 29th of the, of the previous year. Also, I moved over a thousand miles to get away from him. And so even though it was hard to break up, so to speak, we were broken up, but we still continued some of the same patterns we had. I was still attempting to move on, maybe not making a, the best attempt, but um, when somebody introduced us through text message, we began to call and 
just sort of hit it off. We were just talking friends, and it was only a potential thing. So I didn't consider myself seeing Ryan or seeing Travis, but Travis was still the person that I was most intimate with. Why is it that you cannot remember when Travis lent you money, but you remember the exact amount that you lent him all three times? I do remember times he lent me money. Um, I think I got went into a few of those times, and one of the reasons I specifically remember amounts that he lent me is because it's documented in my journal, and I've since reread that journal several times. Why did you think that the incident that happened on June 4, 2008 was any different from the ones before, so that you had to kill him to protect yourself? June 4th was very different in that even though I thought he would never get that way again because it just, like, I think he scared himself when I passed out based on our subsequent conversations and we realized how far it went. I thought that it was done at that point as far as violence goes. So when it happened again and I realized what kind of, how far it can escalate when he gets that angry, um, I was terrified this time especially because he was trying to get on top of me. And also, he just kept coming. He didn't stop. Even when I tried to stop him by running away or pointing a weapon at him, he kept coming and kept coming, and he just did not stop. You mentioned injuries that would not have been seen by others when you were in Utah in June of 2008. Can you go into detail as to where they were and how you received them? Yes. My ankles were bleeding, um, not profusely, but they were scratched and they were injured. Um, I had socks and shoes on. Also, when I hit the tile, the back of my head right here slammed on the tile. Um, and I, I do, have, my shoulder's never been the same, but I don't know if it's related to being slammed on the tile or not. Um, it's, it's off is all I can say. It, it hurts constantly, actually. When you injured yourself at Casa Romos, rotating the glasses, did your supervisor have you fill out any forms to document the injury for workers' compensation purposes? No, this was a small business operation. They didn't have formalities like forms and that kind of thing, just what was minimally required as far as being a legal documented worker. It was a very, it was a less formal, it wasn't a corporate kind of setting where those kind of formalities were done. Who was the main factor in your decision to move from Big Sur slash Palm Desert to Mesa, Travis or Rachel? It was Travis, ultimately. You testified that you thought you heard his footsteps. If you weren't sure, why didn't you just run downstairs and out the door? It was all a split second decision, but like I had said, when I got toward the carpet area, that's where he caught my wrist before when I began running down that hallway um, on a previous occasion. And so here I am running away from him down the hallway again. And on the previous occasion, my intention was to run out of the room and I didn't make it out of the room. So rather than try to this time open the door and run out of the room, this closet door was open and I knew there was another exit so I just ran into that as quickly as I could. Why would you take the time to delete the photos off the camera after you killed Travis? I, that would go with all the other things that I did that day. When things happened, I don't have memory of it, specific memory of it at all. But I mean, I could... Sustained. You stated you remember dropping the knife and hearing it hit the tile. What happened to the knife after that? I don't recall what specifically happened right after that. I just know that it didn't go with me in the car. Sustained. If your phone had died while at Travis's, why not use a wall charger so you would have it charged before you got on the road? That was a thought of mine, but Travis did not have a wall charger. 
um, that had a plug that fit my type of phone. So I was not able to charge it there either. In your email to Travis after June 4, 2008, you told him you would sleep in his bed while he was in Cancun. Did you ever stay overnight at his house without him there? Yes, when I was pet sitting Napoleon, I did that. How is it that you were so calm on the television interviews? I wanted to, I tried very hard to present the best image I could, and I had had a lot of prior experiences experience of pretending that everything was okay when it wasn't on the, everything on the surface was okay when really it wasn't. Um, I was accustomed to that and also I wanted to portray that, that I'm confident and that I'm okay, you know, I didn't do this, no worries. That's what I really wanted to get across at that time and then I wanted to kill myself so that I would never have to own up to it. You stated in the 48 Hours interview that Travis's family deserved to know the truth. If you really believed that, why didn't you confess then? That was not entirely true in that I didn't want them to know certain truths. And again, I said that because it's a derivative of my attempt to deny that I had anything to do with it. If Travis wanted the phone sex conversations recorded, why didn't he record them? His phone did not have that capability, and neither did mine until I bought the Helio, or until Gus got me the Helio. Um, I discovered that feature, and we joked back and forth about it, and then I began to record them when we decided we would do that. His phone didn't have recording capability. If you didn't want to be tied up to a tree, why would you go up and look for a place where he could do that? It wasn't being tied to the tree that I was looking for. We were looking for a place out in the woods, nature, to somehow carry out this Little Red Riding Hood fantasy. And my understanding of that is that it would involve sex. But he had many other ideas, as you heard on the tape. It didn't necessarily mean that I was going to go for all those. I was kind of pushing my own limits anyway by going out to the woods to find a spot and that was the purpose was for that fantasy but not specifically getting tied to a tree. If you drop the camera on the bath mat, how is it that it rolled all the way in front of the bathtub? On the diagram it looks very far but it's really a distance of this. You have the shower, there's a very thin wall and then the bathtub begins right here. So. Wherever I was standing here, it didn't have to roll. It just bounced right off the mat, and it's not way down by the bathroom area, but it's right near the bathtub at that point. There's only a distance of about this much between the shower and the bathtub. On the phone sex tape, when Travis was talking about photos and taking video, was that all part of his fantasy? Taking photos and video, yes, that was a fantasy that he hoped to realize. Did you ever voice any concern to Travis about being uncomfortable with some of his sexual fantasies? Yes, there was one fantasy that he wanted to do, which was pulling off on the side of a freeway exit and having sex on the hood of a car. And I, was, I told him that that would be impossible. I couldn't even think of an exit in rural Northern California where that could be accomplished and nobody would see us. So, that and I was a little uncomfortable with the mile high thing that he wanted to do because this, the flight attendants monitor, tend to monitor who's going and coming from the bathroom and they don't allow two people in the bathroom at once. So just those two that I recall. Why didn't you call Ryan and tell him you were going to Arizona when you decided you were going to Arizona? I guess I didn't want Ryan to know that I still had the interest that I had in Travis. Um, it would be kind of, just the way I didn't want Travis to know that, but for different reasons, that I was interested in Ryan, I kind of felt like, how would it sound if I called up this guy that I'm gonna go meet and say, hey, I'm gonna go hang out with my ex-boyfriend for a little while, sorry. You know, I just, I didn't feel, I didn't feel, 
comfortable or like that was something that I would have done is say, let him know I'm going to go hang out with my ex and then I'll swing by and meet you or something. It was a bad decision, but I made a lot of bad decisions when it came to Travis. You have testified to many different occasions where you performed sexual favors with Travis to keep him pleased and happy. Are you saying you never got pleasure out of sex with Travis? Definitely not. I did. Um, many occasions he was very romantic, very loving, and I guess you could say attentive, and he cared about my pleasure as well. Not always, um, but there were times when he was, when we were very compatible in that regard. Why would you continue to carry your journals around with you if it was possible others, including Travis, might find them and read them? To my knowledge, no one else read my journals. Um, and then once I discovered that Travis did, I was a little more guarded about it, but I kept my journal inside my purse and my purse zipped up and I, nobody really went through my purse, so I considered it safe in my purse because nobody got into my purse except me, typically. Why were the laws of attraction so important to follow, but the law of chastity was not? I believed that I was following the law of chastity for a long time. I realize now that I was not. Um, the law of attraction was also a huge philosophy of mine. It was, it was my second religion, pretty much. Um, also, the law of ch with the law of chastity and what it prohibits, there is a great deal of temptation when I would hang out with Travis. And even though we eventually did begin to, under how I understood it, openly violate the law of chastity, it was kind of like, I don't know, I guess it's, it's, hard, to, it's hard to describe. I mean, I think it was temptation, it was weakness, it was not that I didn't believe in the law of chastity, but when it came to Travis, I that was more important. Do the laws of attraction also apply to recording phone sex conversations? The law of attraction? I guess it could be construed that way in that um, when we were doing those things, I got positive, um, I had positive interaction with Travis. He wasn't angry, he was complimentary, he would say, things that were that in, in a complimentary way. He would be nice to me, uh, so it was the attention that I craved. And the law of attraction does state that you focus mo more on the qualities of the person that you like and don't focus on the qualities that you don't like. And so when we were doing those things, we were both focused on each other in maybe not a spiritually positive way, but in a way that made me feel good and him as well. You stated there were times that Travis made you tear out pages of negative things that you said about him. Right before that, you said you wouldn't write negative things about Travis in your journal, which is correct. They're both correct. The entry that he made me tear out was very detailed and a lot more, I was quoting him directly on a couple of things he had said. Um, and when he discovered those, he made me, and my feelings. So I used to write things to purge. Um, when he admonished me and reminded me of the secret, um, at that point, I became, I wrote less specific things. Um, sometimes I would just write about my emotions, and sometimes those were negative. But writing about suicidal thoughts, for example, helped me process it. And getting it down on paper helped it get it out of me, I felt like. So when it came to Travis, I would be less specific. Like, I would write, today Travis was obscenely mean to me, but I wouldn't go into detail about what that meant. I just remember that that was a really bad day, so I would write something to that effect. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to take a 10 minute recess at this time. Please remember the admonition, be back in the designated area at 3.50. I'm sorry, right, 3.50. You're excused. Please be seated. The record will show the presence of the jury, the defendant, and all counsel.
Can we see other examples of when you called men that you did not have romantic interests in Hadi Biscotti? Are there text messages, emails, or instant messages? Um, probably, well, none that I've seen that have been recovered, but there would be some in text messages. I texted Daryl a lot. Um, I texted my little brother a lot. Shown not what she's telling them. Approach, please. Did you call any men you did not have romantic interests in Hadi Biscotti in text messages, emails, or instant messages? Yes. Text messages, not the other. In two. text messages? Yes. <clears throat> If you were not going to marry Travis because of the January 21, 2008 and January 22, 2008 events, why stay with him at all? It was difficult to stay away from him. It was difficult to break away from him. And when he would invite me over, I would, it was very hard to say no. He was persuasive and he still had an effect on me that when I came over, when he was in a good mood, it made me feel good. And I enjoyed being with him during those times. And that's something I was familiar with. Do you, do you feel the guys in your life cheated on you because you were controlling? I feel it was just the opposite. Uh, I feel that they cheated on me because I was too tolerant, um, I was very trusting, implicitly trusting and very naive, and I gave them <coughs> the freedom to be and do what they wanted when they wanted, and I think they took advantage of that. Were you mad at Travis while you were stabbing him? I don't recall fear being a prominent, I mean, sorry, I don't recall anger being a prominent. She didn't remember, she does remember, she should tell us. I remember emotions, Judge. Right, the question is, were you mad at Travis while you were stabbing him? I don't remember being angry that day. I remember being terrified. So, stabbing him. I'm going to sustain the objection. I think you've answered the question. How is it that you remember so many of your sexual encounters, including your ex-boyfriends, but you do not remember stabbing Travis and dragging his body? Well, as far as what happened on June 4th, I don't know how the mind works necessarily, but I know that that was the most traumatic experience of my life. And outside of those blanks and the ones that I've mentioned as far as that were alcohol related when I was a teenager, um, I don't have 
other blackouts that I can recall, just when memories get foggy, when I get stressful. I think actually that I have a very good memory. I can remember tons of things. But when I'm under a stressful situation, it's as if my mind, if you can imagine a computer that freezes, it's turned on, but it's not functioning. And you can hit the keys, but nothing's happening. Just like the sound waves are hitting my ears, but the brain is not computing. It's kind of like that. So I don't black out during those times, but my mind is not processing the English words that are being sent to me, or he screamed at me, or whichever. During cross-examination, you were asked if you were crying when you stabbed Travis, and you said no. How do you know that if you had a memory gap at that time? I think that was misunderstood. I said I don't know, and I know I was probably crying when I said that, and maybe I didn't speak up clearly enough, but I said I don't know, not know. You stated you bought a gun to commit suicide, but never ended up doing it. What stopped you from doing so? I was going to wait until I left Wairika and got to the Salinas or Monterey area so that it didn't happen right in my family's own backyard, so to speak. Um, and I was leaving for that area the morning I was arrested, actually. You stated you would not want kids with Travis because you would be worried about them. If that is the case, why did you tell Leslie you couldn't wait until your kids and Travis's kids could play together at future PPL events? Um, I wanted Travis to be viewed in a positive light, and I know that he wanted to be viewed in a positive light. I didn't want to de-edify him. Especially not at the, especially not at the moment that I made those statements. And also, prior to June fourth, that was a hope of mine. It wasn't that I couldn't wait. It's just that sometimes PPL events would be family oriented, and I was I would hope that our families would be able to be cordial and kind. Not that we would be ultimately very close, but just. That was a hope of mine, that we could someday be happy for each other in our respective marriages. And I didn't want to say anything bad about him. A lot of your answers to the questions you were asked made it seem like you put Travis's feelings and priorities before your own. If that were true, why didn't you call for help after you shot Travis? Usually his priorities went before mine when it was something that he wanted. When the gun went off, I didn't know that I had shot him. I thought it hit a wall. So as far as not calling 911, immediately after it wasn't an option, he lunged at me and we fell and wrestled there for a quick second before I broke away. Um, and then as far as not calling 911, like I said, I can't really explain my state of mind following, immediately following, and after that it was, it was basically fear-based as far as not calling any authority or telling any authority at all. Why did you decide to tell the truth two years after the killing? It took two years um, because I was very deeply ashamed of what had happened. Um, <clears throat> I used to consider people who were violent in any form to be somewhat unevolved. That's how I looked at it. And now I was that kind of person to a very extreme degree. And I was horrified with myself and very ashamed. And it wasn't the kind of person that I was trying to portray to the world, as well as who I even believed I ever could be, inside or out. However, as time went on, and I evolve and I mature and I gain more perspective as things get farther away, there were a lot of people that reached out to me and offered support because they believed in my stupid story. And I felt really bad for that because they were there for me and they wanted to offer moral support. And I felt fraudulent the more things 
the farther along things got. At first it was like, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm gonna be dead soon, so I won't have to answer that. And then it, it started off as a secret that I wanted to take to my grave with me, and then it became one that I, I didn't wanna keep anymore. So it wasn't an overnight decision. It was a very gradual process, and it just, I felt fraudulent. You start just feeling, I mean, obviously I did from the beginning, but it becomes a really yucky feeling inside. You just, it doesn't feel good. What made you change your mind and tell everyone about Travis's secret, the child picture? Well, the first time I decided to was when I was talking to a psychologist um, from California and we were exploring dynamics of our relationship and it took me a long time but several months beyond that I told other people. It it became I had made a promise to him that I would never say anything and so he made a promise that he would get help and I wanted to keep my promise I didn't want to throw mud on him he was it's not like he was a threat that he, anything was going to happen to any children at this point why even go there why tell anyone but it was such a huge part of our relationship and that everything thereafter changed, everything. So when I realized that in retrospect, I don't think he ever upheld his end of the bargain, I felt less obligated to keep that secret and also it was just, it changed everything in our relationship. So leaving that element out, it's like a huge missing piece of the puzzle of how things ultimately evolved the way they did. You said you were sick to your stomach when you saw Travis with child pictures. So why did you sleep with him again? Um, well, after throwing up a few times that day, um, I wanted to talk to him and give him a chance to explain what was going on. So we ended up getting together later on after FHE, um, much later in the evening. and. He gave me a tearful explanation, and I felt more sympathetic toward him than disgusted at that point because of how he explained it to me. Would you classify your relationship with Travis Alexander as a love-hate relationship? Uh, it certainly had all the motions of a love-hate relationship but I never felt that I hated Travis. I screamed that out one time when he wasn't present um, after a really mean phone call, but I never felt hatred toward Travis, although we had those ups and downs that were pretty extreme. On June 4, 2008, after you got up and ran toward the closet, is it possible that Travis picked up the camera on the bathroom floor and moved it. Yeah, and to clarify, I didn't run toward the closet. I ran down the hall right after I rolled away from him. And that's completely possible, and that's an idea I've entertained um, also. But I didn't see anything. I just ran, and I didn't look back. Could that also explain the delay in his arrival and his anger in the closet at the door threshold? Would that be the camera related? Yes. It certainly could. Um, the delay, maybe he was, the floor was wet and he was, I don't know if it just the traction, but I mean, with him getting down the hallway, I don't know. But the camera, I don't even remember how the camera ended up where it did. So I don't know if he picked it up and inspected it or how it got kicked around or if it got kicked around, that kind of thing. Given that there are guiding principles such as the law of attraction and practices like passing down journals 
to future generations, do you feel the Mormon religion encourages burying the truth about issues that may be considered embarrassing? Encourages burying the truth? Yes. Well, to be clear, the Law of Attraction and the Mormon Church are two separate animals. Um, they intertwine in some ways with certain scripture, but they are completely separate. Um, in Mormonism, being a religion, um, I felt that there was an unspoken undercurrent in the church, which puts pressure on members to present a squeaky clean image. Um, however, I know that's not official church policy, even though that you feel that pressure when you're in the church. Um, my understanding of official church policy is if you have transgressed in any way, no matter how embarrassing, if it's a serious transgression, you it's dealt with internally in the church, um, internally inside, but also in with a church authority such as your bishop or any other appropriate church authority. Um, the law of attraction, the way I embraced it four or five years ago, I did. I would. I was in denial. Like I didn't want to deal with the negative things I was going through because I felt that by dealing with them, I would then be focusing on them, and then that would attract more of them, rather than dealing with them in a healthy way to eradicate them. So I kind of lost track of the question. I'm sorry. The question was: Do you feel the Mormon religion encourages burying the truth about issues that may be considered embarrassing? The Mormon religion, yes. Um, you are encouraged always to tell the truth no matter how bad it is. That doesn't mean broadcasting it, but going through the appropriate channels for repentance. Can you give a few examples of what might be considered negative other than those already discussed? Ex negative experiences? This says negative. I think it's in connection with your journals. Um, well, I don't know that that means specifically to me, but other than the violating the law of chastity or violence, that kind of thing, um, words that you speak. Um, there is doctrine in the church which which says that every word that flows from our mouth, we will be held accountable for those words one day. Um, so that's an example of something negative. Um, I know some Mormons that drink. That's an example of something negative. Um, I know gay Mormons and homosexuality is prohibited in the church. That's something the church considers negative. It's not my philosophy. Um, there are things to that effect. I mean, plenty of things that go on and on. So, I mean, I guess there would be an example as far as the homosexuality goes, because Travis wanted to have a threesome with another woman. And I wasn't, I mean, I don't, I'm not gay, but it was something I was contemplating going along with. So that obviously, in addition to the sexual sin, depending on what interaction I may or may not have had with that woman, could also be a violation of another law in that regard. How do you determine when you will tell the truth and when you will not tell the truth? What are the determining factors? Anything that related back to my involvement in Travis's death or de-edifying him in any way, I covered up. I attempted to cover up. So the, the lies that I told after all of this happened were re direct related to those two main themes. When did you find Travis's gun? It would have been October, November, sometime in the fall. It was before Christmas, 2007. I know it was before Christmas. I don't remember the exact time in the fall. Was it kept loaded in the closet? 
He told me it was not loaded. Okay. He told me it wasn't He assured me it wasn't loaded because I... Sustained. Sustained. Okay. Should I... Wait for another question. Okay. Today, March 5, 2013, you stated before lunch that you think you fill the car up first. If you did have the third gas can, as we saw in several hypothetical situations after lunch, do you see it possible to put 8.301 gallons of gas in the car, exhibit number 237.011, and then 9.59 gallons and 2.774 gallons for a total of 12.368 gallons in the remaining three gas cans. Exhibits 237.011, 237.012, and 237.013. Okay, that was a, a lot of elements to that question. So first, I didn't have three gas cans. Um, she actually had no response. She was asking if it's possible, assuming she had three gas cans. Overruled. You may continue. I didn't have three gas cans. Um, I believe we were discussing a hypothetical if I had three gas cans. No, it wouldn't make sense to put only two gallons and change into one gas can while filling up the others. And as far as whether I think I filled up the car first or not, I honestly don't know what came first. I do remember having a fear of filling the gas can, overfilling them, because I didn't want overflow because it's a highly flammable substance. So I remember that, so I can't say that I filled them all the way to their maximum capacity or not. Um, but I wouldn't have only put two gallons in one if I'd filled up two more. I only had two anyway. So there were never three on that trip when I pulled out of Salinas. You initially testified that sex was a way for Travis to relieve stress and later testified it was a way for him to relieve anger, which is correct. Both are correct. Um, anger was stressful and he had the term de-stress and sex was a way to de-stress. And it seemed like after he climaxed that he felt a lot more calm. How do you know that? Based on his demeanor and conversations we've had regarding that and requests that he's made specifically to that, of that nature and the term de-stress. Would a screwdriver be required to take off the license plates? I heard... Sustained. Okay. Would a screwdriver be required to take off the license plates? I believe so, because we had, Ryan had to borrow a screwdriver from Sustained. Sustained. Did you find it strange that only your license plate was messed with in that parking lot? I don't know that only my license plate was messed with. If you were driving to a place you had never been before, meaning Utah, why wouldn't you map out different towns that would have gas stations or rest stations? I did go to MapQuest and to determine the number of hours it might take. And I printed out MapQuest directions. And I also printed out MapQuest directions from San Diego to West Jordan, as well as Pasadena or Los Angeles, whichever area, to West Jordan. Um, I wouldn't know what website to even visit. I guess I could have gone to Google and just typed in where are the gas stations on I-5 to bring all that up. Um, I'm not aware of a website that specifically um, shows those things. It's for that purpose. I only knew of MapQuest and I printed directions that way because I had relied on my GPS all these years, but I wasn't going to be taking that car with the GPS, which usually just guided me and could tell me where the gas stations were. Did you ever see a doctor for your memory issues? 
I don't believe that I have memory issues that are really persistent. I just have trouble processing things under stressful circumstances. And June 4th is kind of in a class of its own. Um, outside of those things, I feel like I have a really good memory. And I never thought to seek medical help or any kind of professional help for that. If you were scared of Travis's anger and violence, why would you go upstairs when he was banging his head, knowing he was already mad? Well, Travis had never, when I didn't know he was banging his head, I just didn't know what this steady noise was. It was kind of just a pounding, not incredibly loud, but loud enough to hear from downstairs. And two, he had never been violent with me prior to that, except, the, I mean, it wasn't violent. The only time he'd been physical was when he grabbed my wrist at the convention. Um, so I didn't really fear physical harm from him at that point in time. Did Travis ever tell you he kept his gun loaded? He told me at one time that he did consider, he considered loading it, but he assured me that it was not loaded. If you did not think the gun was loaded, why chance grabbing a gun that may not be loaded instead of just running outside? I grabbed the gun not because I intended to shoot him. I grabbed the gun because my thought is that if a gun is pointed, you stop. Whether it's loaded or not, I've always been taught you don't point guns at people, period, just as a safety precaution. So I can only imagine what I would do in that situation if a gun were pointed at me, I would stop. And I was hoping that it would have that effect on him. You stated that when you walked out of Starbucks, you did not <coughs> notice anything wrong with the back of the car. How is it that the back license plate ended upside down? I didn't see anyone turning my license plate upside down nor did I notice the license plate when I walked out. What I noticed is kids skating away from my car. <coughs> it's possible that it could have happened. Overall. It's possible that it could have happened at any point during my trip. I could have even rented the car that way and never noticed. But I believe. Sustained. Why did you plan on going to see John Dixon when you were on your way to Utah to see Ryan? John Dixon was a friend, um, although there was a somewhat of an interest there, it was nothing that I ever let grow because he wasn't a church member, so it would be kind of a poor investment of my heart to get attached to somebody who was not a member of the church. What I was going down there for is he had a friend who either owned a gallery or ran a gallery where he hung some of the greats, such as Van Gogh and Monet. And when I told him I painted, he said, we can make a space in this gallery for you. I can hang it right next to a Monet or Van Gogh. It sounded like a very big, it sounded like a very exciting thing for me because one of my goals at that time was to get my paintings into galleries. How many men were you willing to be involved with at the same time? Um, well, it depends on the level of intimacy. As far as a boyfriend, I have one, boyfriend at a time, um, an intimate partner, one at a time. Um, in the church, you are encouraged to go and... She's actually not responsible. She's actually one at a time. Completely responsible. I'm sorry, I can't hear you, counsel. She's actually not responsive. She's already indicated one, and then she wants to talk about the church. It varies. She's explaining her answer and her beliefs about dating as the question called for. Overall, you may continue. In the church, you're encouraged to date around and find somebody that you might be compatible with and not to get too serious with somebody that you don't think would you would be very compatible with. So Mormons are encouraged to go on group dates and not spend too much time together with only one person unless you are certain that you're going to start getting serious with that person. Did you ever seek medical help for your mental condition? I'm not sure what mental condition, 
um, that refers to. But Have you ever taken medication for your memory issue? No. Did you ever tell anyone about your condition prior to the killing? I don't really think I had much of a condition prior to the killing. Um, just, I mean, I have ADD, I think, because I'm spaced out, but I don't. She told somebody about it, not Sustained. Okay. You told us that you were not able to make out the license plate leaning against the curb in front of your car because you are nearsighted and did not get glasses until 2010. What is your prescription in each eye? My understanding is that my prescription is 2.5, negative 2.5 and negative 2.25. Is there anyone who saw you shaking during a fight with Travis? Dan, Dan saw me visibly upset after. Um, but I don't think anybody saw us fighting during, at least to the level of fights where it would cause me to shake. Do any of your journal entries or any other items discuss you shaking or blacking out or getting scrambled? Possibly allusions to getting scrambled, but I had not blacked out. Um, except, like I said, those two times when I, they were alcohol induced. One time I did induce blacking out with some friends. That was earlier than that. And that was a one time incident. Um, but. I didn't journal blacking out because there were no incidents during those times that I was journaling. And shaking, I mean, I shook when I wrote, but I didn't write that I was shaking. So probably only when I got scrambled. There were times when I would write things. You claim to have memory lapses or gaps during times of stress, such as when you are being yelled at or grilled. How is it that you have such vivid and specific memories of violence and yelling by Travis such a long time ago if this is the case? With the violence, it's not that I have to process the English language. It's more, I feel those things. Um, I know he broke my finger because it's still broken or it's healed, but it's crooked. Um, I know he choked me out because I woke up from being unconscious. Um, as far as him yelling, I know he's yelling because there's a loud volume and it has an effect on me. I don't know all the things he said. Um, for example, the night he was, he said disparaging things about my grandfather and my brother. Those stand out, but that's all I can remember of a three hour session of him screaming at me and before I was able to leave. So many things were said, um, mean things, and I didn't process them all. Um, some I wrote down and that's when he made me tear them out. So I don't, I didn't write them after that. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to take the evening recess. Please be back in the designated area at 1015. Please remember the admonition. You are excused. Have a nice evening. Thank you.